Hello, everyone, and warm welcome to a regional webinar on the Digital Disaster Risk Reduction Maturity Model, DDRRMM. I am Miu Yokota, a coordination consultant with Disaster Risk Reduction and Recovery for Building Resilience Team at Bangkok Regional Hub, UNDP. I am pleased to moderate today's webinar and welcome our speakers and participants from different UN agencies. This webinar is organized by the Asia Pacific Issue Based Coalition, IBC, on Building Resilience. The IBC on Building Resilience is co chaired by UNDP and UNDR and brings together 19 UN entities to accelerate actions on disaster risk reduction, climate change adaptation, and resilience in the Asia Pacific region. During today's webinar, we will introduce and present case studies for the DDRMM methodology and the resources and the tools that are available to utilize this methodology in practice. The DDRMM methodology was developed and applied by UNDP and a regional project titled DX for Resilience to benchmark progresses in countries in terms of digital transformation for disaster risk reduction and identify areas where the further strengthening is necessary to address systemic and multidimensional risk. So the webinar today is a 90 minute session, which we are organized into six different sections. First, we will start with the opening remark by Mr. Shani Hegiros to set the scene. Then we will move to Dr. Tarek Rashid's uh, introduction on DDRMM methodology and details of how it can be applied. After that, Mr. Rod Calzado from the Philippines will provide details of the how UNDP in the Philippines utilize this methodology in their assessment of digital maturity in the country. Next, we will have an open discussion and Q&A sessions for about 30 minutes. And after that, uh, UNDP uh, disaster risk reduction team will share information on the incoming plans, how to move forward based on our experience using the DDRM methodology. And finally, Ms. Diana Patricia Mosquera Carr will give the closing remark. Okay, so now let us move to the first part of the webinar, the opening session. I would like to invite Mr. Sani Ramos Hegros, Senior Advisor and Team Leader, Disaster Risk Reduction and Recovery for Building Resilience Team at the UNDP Bangkok Regional Hub. Sunny, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mio. Uh, welcome to all, and thank you very much, colleagues, for joining the webinar today on the Digital Risk Reduction Maturity Model, the UNDP, and its partners' experiences. Today's webinar is a collaboration among IBC resilience members in Bangkok who have a collaborative work plan for 2022 and will encourage participants here to participate at some of the upcoming events for the rest of the year. For instance, associated to the topic today on digital resources and technologies, UNDP Bangkok Regional Hub shall be presenting next mm -hmm. week in another IBC event on the topic, which is uh, labeled as process model for mapping and analysis of vulnerable groups and co-creation of digital solutions. This collaboration supports governments, CSOs, private sector to accelerate their efforts on digital transformation, particularly for enabling the agenda of resilience and leaving no one behind. Let me explain for a moment the link between resilience building and digital technologies as drivers of transformation for achieving sustainable development goals. In the UNDP strategic plan, building resilience is a signature solution or a flagship project or portfolio, as well as a goal for transformational change. So it's a process and a goal for UNDP. 
Transformation in building resilience means strengthening countries and institutions to prevent, mitigate, and respond to crisis, conflict, natural hazards, health threats, climate, social, and economic shocks. Whereas digital strategy in the UNDP strategic plan is an enabler or an answer to enhance resilient solutions to accelerate such transformational change. This therefore involves the need for UNDP to work with partners such as yourself in holistic digital transformation efforts to advocate for an, ex an inclusive and responsible digital solutions for sustainable development and as well as to continue our own internal digital transformation. Now, we are discussing today and next week the importance of optimizing digital technologies and making better use of data. The latter has been the slogan of the UN Secretary General's data strategy and it sets for enablers to accelerate progress towards its goal. First, build data skills and talents and spread the culture of collaboration, openness and sharing, which is referred to as the people and culture strategy. Secondly, to build governance mechanisms and strategy oversight to manage data as a strategic, a shared strategic asset. And this is referred to as data governance and strategy. Thirdly, connect sustainably to ecosystem outside the family, outside of the UN family, so we can jointly unlock more value at scale. And this is referred to as partnership strategy. And lastly, to empower all users with tool sets and processes in optimal ways so data can turn into insight and action, which is referred to as the technology application environment. Now, these four enablers are icon in some form or another in strategies development by several UN organizations, include, including the new UNDP digital strategy, and I hope you have read it uh, recently, but also the UNEP digital transformation program and the FAO's digital agriculture initiative. Now, this example underlines the consensus within the broader UN system that digital transformation is an important and pivotal vehicle for achieving better use of, of data. Let's focus a bit on data. In addition to better use of data, there is also a need for a close consideration of all components that make up the data ecosystem, which include policies, people, processes, collaboration and partnership, computing infrastructure, tools and services. It's a, an ecosystem that encompasses many of these things and all of these things. When these components are intact and working in harmony and balance, we have a, de a healthy data ecosystem that supports evidence-based decision-making processes, creates actionable information products, and streamlines collaboration and operations for disaster reduction and climate change adaptation, and more importantly, citizen participation and supporting inclusion. The challenge for all of us, and I'm sure this is why you're attending this webinar, is for us to understand how to properly diagnose the data ecosystem health and when the status of this ecosystem is deemed unhealthy to identify how and where digital transformation to improve or intervene to improve the situation. Now this is where this webinar comes in to address these challenges. This model which will be explained to you further by way of concept and examples was adapted from other process models. McKinsey, Harvard, OECD, you know, a lot of these organizations have, are using this for their own organization. But this, we conduct this under the Regional Disaster uh, Transformation for Resilience Project, through which UNDP and the Government of Japan supported countries to accelerate disaster risk reduction and enhance crisis response through digital solutions. So, we developed the DDRM model as a tool to perform a systematic and standard diagnostic tool that is holistic and comprehensive. It targets the entire ecosystem of digital transformation, which I mentioned earlier. 
which I repeat, technology, infrastructure, data, tools, services, people, par 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 policy, partnerships, and applications for disaster reduction and management operations. Now, the examples that uh, you will hear today is a few of, of the DRRM assessment in four countries in Indonesia, in Nepal, the Philippines, and Sri Lanka, which actually generate very interesting and insightful digital diagnostic and data governance assessment for over 51 institutions. So it's not just the NDMO, but across the different institutions who have a stake in resiliency building. Now we use the assessment results to provide guidance to the governments, help strengthen their DRR efforts, and enable them to benchmark their own progress towards the full potential of digital technologies for DRR, and of course, identify areas of improvement. In, the, in addition, the assessment were also applied by UNDP in partnership with UNDRR to conduct an in-depth analysis of the current status of national disaster database system in 13 countries globally in order to support the new generation of disaster data and information system in line with the specific and context level of digital maturities in each country. The pre summary of this study will soon be released for wider distribution by both our organizations. So today, we're very happy to share more information about the assessment, the methodology, the tools and resources I'll share with it, and case studies of how it has been applied. During the webinar, we will also share a white paper that describes the methodology in detail and provides practical tips on applying the methodology and interpreting its results to develop intervention strategies for digital transformation. It, is, it will be very revealing. I would like to encourage all of you to read the white paper and share it with government officials and development partners. Our team, in close collaboration with members of the IBC on Building Resilience, will stand ready to support the implementation and institutionalization of the DDRRMM methodology. Thank you very much and looking forward to this very interesting discussion. Thank you very much, Sunny, for these enlightening remarks. <coughs> Excuse me. It is very important for us to understand the broader context of DDRMM methodology and also its relevance to the mission of IBC on building resilience and how it is connected to the data and digital and partnership strategies by different UN agencies. So I am sure the audience now extra curious to learn more about DDRMMM. And therefore, let me invite Dr. Tarek Rashid, who will be presenting us with an introduction to DDRMM. Tarek is a technology strategist and international digitalization consultant, as well as the regional coordinator for the regional DX for resilience project, particularly on the output one, which focused on digitalizing disaster risk information. Tarek formerly served as the director of geoinformatics at Indiana University and also held faculty positions at the University of Indiana, so in University of Redlands, University of Oklahoma, University of Southern California, and New Mexico State University in the US. His consulting portfolio spans across over uh, 50 IT and developmental projects implemented in 28 countries across the world. So Tarek, who is yours? Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Mayo. Let me share my screen first. And then basically, you guys, I hope you see my screen. Thank you again, Mayo, for the introduction. Hello, to everyone, and greetings from Indiana, USA. Uh, I'm grateful to the IBC on Building Resilience for organizing this webinar and thrilled to introduce the digital disaster risk reduction model in the next 30 minutes. Uh, this introduction just aimed to give you a generic background and especially about the context and the reason that led to the development of the DRRM and describe the model and give some examples. My colleague uh, Rod Calzado will walk you through a detailed case study in the next part of this presentation. So, um, just make sure that, yeah. 
So as mentioned by Sani, uh, DDRRMM was one of the products that came out of the DX for Resilience projects. So therefore, I thought to start uh, with a brief introduction uh, about the project and then move from this to introduction to DRRM with an overview of um, the rationale and how the idea came in the first place and the challenges that the DDRRMM uh, meant to address. Then I'll go through the model itself and its main constructs. And then finally, I will finish with some highlights on how DDRRM has been applied so far, um, you know, in the past year and a half. Um, DX uh, for resilience stands for accelerating disaster risk reduction and enhancing crisis response through digital solution. The project started in June 2020 and concluded recently on March 31st, 2022. The project was funded by the Japanese government and piloted in Indonesia, Nepal, the Philippines, and Sri Lanka. Um, the project had three main interconnected and overlapping tracks or outputs. The first output focused on digitalization of disaster risk data and technology to support disaster risk reduction and management. Uh, output number two focused on digital solution targeting the most vulnerable groups. And output number three, focus on partnership for digital transformation in support of disaster risk reduction and management. Uh, uh, DDRRMM was developed from output one, which has a track and its focus on digitalization of disaster risk data and cloud-based technology in the project countries, aimed to support the digital transformation progress in each country. There, uh, were uh, four critical issues that uh, needed to be addressed when we started to consider digital transformations in the context of disaster risk reduction and management. And these issues, you know, the first of them was the nature of the risk itself. Risks are more and more becoming systemic in the sense they are significantly impacting the entire system, not only parts of it. We all have lived COVID and how it affected every aspect of our lives. And the data that you know, captures the extent and the impact of systemic risk is becoming overwhelmingly big, complex, diverse, and um, coming with very high volumes and very high speed. Digital transformation should make governments and institutions better, beware, uh, better prepared to deal with systemic risk and more capable of handling challenges related to big data. So that was the first, basically, you know, one of the major things that we had to take into account when thinking about basically, you know, you know, developing, you know, a solution that, you know, address, you know, the use of digital transformation to support, you know, dealing with disaster systemic risk, uh, systemic disaster risks. Uh, the second issue was related to technology. The core digital technology transformation focus is changing fast. State of the art in technology today may become obsolete 10 years from now. For example, the way computer systems are interfacing today and how data are stored in the database has rapidly changed to accommodate requirements related to the increasing volumes of data and the speeds they need to be processed. So again, so basically another main challenge is criteria we have to take account of how rapid technology change. The third part, which is the most critical, I guess, in my opinion, is related to how we approach digital transformation in the context of disaster risk reduction and management. We are still focused on divide and conquer intervention strategy, reacting to challenges as they arise and building digital solution operating in silos. But the domain we are working with is very, very complex. Actually, we are dealing with a hierarchy of complexity. The first level of the hierarchy is related to the ecosystem of disaster risk data, where many factors related to the use of technology, available resources, why data is collected and how it is shared, etc., impact the health of this ecosystem and whether it is capable of handling the demands brought about by systemic and integrated risk management. The second level of the the second level of hierarchy in the complexity of the ecosystem that we are dealing with for digital transformation is in the way disaster risk reduction and management operates. So the, the disaster risk reduction and management domain. As in the data ecosystem, there are so many factors impacting how tasks and operati operations related to disaster risk reduction and management are conducted, whether they're reactive or proactive and to what extent they are performed in harmony. And then the 
finally, there is a broad context of resilience and sustainability where, where uh, complexity peaks with so many processes and causal feedback loops such as climate change, population growth, epidemics, all they are interacting and impacting each other. So basically what we are dealing with is a sort of nested hierarchy of complexity requires system thinking and holistic approach to digital transformation. And DDRRM was one of the reasons we developed DDRRM to address this kind of complexity and nested hierarchy of complexity, looking at data ecosystem, how it fits in the disaster risk reduction ecosystem, and how all of this fits in this broader context of sustainability and resilience. The final issue impacting basically digital transformation is the increase uh, increased demand for evidence-based investment and data-driven decision-making for digital transformation intervention. Uh, today, just, you know, Sani just gave us a reference to the UN data strategy and how it promotes data-driven decision-making. He also mentioned the digital strategy developed by UNDP, FAO, IU, UNEP, and how they all echo the same goal, which is basically better use of data. So we are witnessing a paradigm uh, shift toward data-driven decision-making where decision concerning digital transformation interventions should be based on solid evidence and analytics rather than riding the wave and replicating solutions applying, uh, replicating solution blindly from one place to another without basically giving attention to the context at which this application or technology is implemented. So all these uh, combined together gave rise to the development of DTRRMM. We needed a tool that would help us conduct an informed and comprehensive diagnosis of the current status of digital transformation in a given context, whether this context is a country, a province, a local, or even an organization. A tool that is capable of showing us how the technology in this particular context helps us handle uh, systemic risk, cope with rapid technology changes, and produce evidence for effective disaster risk reduction decisions. Using this and using the analogy of health checkup, which I just did, you know, the couple of days ago because I'm making a medical operation on Friday, we needed a tool that generate a sort of vital measures to tell you basically what is the health and to what extent basically, you know, this health basically needed certain kind of intervention and what is the most suitable intervention that can capture or can handle this particular health cases. So the value proposition of the use of DDRRM is simple is basically what gets measured gets done. The word maturity here indicates, you know, is our synonym to the word healthy, how healthy the digital ecosystem is, and to what degree a country or an organization is reaping the fruits of digital transformation. So what are these fruits? The, you know, there are mentioned different, every single strategy that the, a UN agency produces has a sort of like, you know, what is the outcome, why you are doing what you are doing. For example, UNDP's uh, digital strategy, and UNDP strategy itself, they have different fruits. Basically, the, you know, they mentioned that the need for strengthening institutional and technology, a technical capacity for the use of application of digital technology. In this, our case, we are focused on DRRM at various scale. Being able to understand and diagnose correctly the health of the digital ecosystem help us better align the technology with various operation and activity pertaining to the disaster risk reduction and management cycle. It helps us also employ the power of digital technology um, to go uh, toward the paradigm shift from reactive emergency relief to proactive integrated disaster risk reduction and management. And finally, it will help us actually taking it to the next level, take all this data that we produce from disaster risk reduction and management into development, developmental and sectoral planning, which basically is the key core goal of the concept of risk informed development. So all this was kind of like giving a value proposition of why we needed to assess or diagnose the health, uh, the status of the digital ecosystem or the health of the digital ecosystem. So DDRRMM as a diagnostic tool had three goals. The first one is benchmarking kind of progress of digital transformation, assessing the health and the degree to which digital resources and technologies available in a given context, a country in our cases, are used to support disaster risk reduction and management. The second goal, was once we do the assessment of this health, then what we do next? Interventions. So basically informing which area of interventions is needed most. There are usually so many directions one can go to, but which one is needed most? So basically helping us actually 
to have a sort of like the diagnostic that will produce help give us evidence to go towards the intervention, the areas that need it most based on the diagnostic that was conducted. And third, which is very important actually, because this is really happening, like, you know, in the monitoring and evaluation, once we implement a project, we haven't, we created a new data warehouse, we implemented this solution. What is the impact of this on this risk reduction and management? Are we able, for example, to reduce the response uh, time of certain uh, incident or disaster to two minutes, to one minute, to whatever certain time? So basically the last rule of the, uh, DDRRMM is to help us evaluating the impact of specific trans digital transformation interventions and to what degree they really produce the promised result. So these are the three goals that were developed in mind and basically of course the white paper available in its third version we have went through a different iteration of revisions so the current state basically describe in detail the details of basically how this can be done using the DDRRM model. Uh, before going a little bit into the details of the DRRM, let me talk a little bit about what maturity models are, because this is important. Maturity model, as also mentioned by Sani, are frameworks that attempt to measure progress made by organizations or institutions uh, to develop and improve their capability in a specific domain. There are so many maturity models, they have been there since the 1970s, so the topic is not really new. And they go the topic from management to education to university accreditation and so on. One of the most known maturity model is CMMI, which stands for Capability Maturity Model Integration, which has been used since the 1990s and has 24 dimensions to evaluate an organization's ability to manage its business. So all maturity model, same the same goal that we have for DDRRMM, benchmarking progress, informing interventions and improvement, and then measuring the impact of this intervention really, does it really lead to the promised improvement or it need to be revised. So basically it is not what we have new. Also, the very concept of maturity, it's important to highlight this because it's just, you know, we talk about it as generic word, we talk about healthy, but what healthy actually, it has a very, very precise meaning, which means perfection. And in perfection, in the maturity model, it has actually a very precise and accurate statistical measures known as six sigma. And six sigma is a statistical presentation of a perfect process that yields no more than 3.4 defects per 1 million operations, which is, stands for about 99.99966%. For example, if we were assess the compliance of disaster, uh, uh, disaster risk data, in terms of how to what extent they are compliant with international standard, ISO standard, for example. In order to deem this data set perfect, we would expect that 99.99966% of the inspected data items are in full compliance with the standard. None of the metadata are there, they are complete, and so on, all these standards. So this is basically when we talk about maturity here in the concept of DDRRM, we're talking about a very, very precise measure. We're striving to reach basically this concept of six sigma. So the far we are from this goal, the less mature we are, which means that lots of work need to be done based on this operation. So this is the concept of what we mean by, um, uh, by uh, maturity model. So uh, moving forward a little bit uh, into basically the, uh, you know, into uh, the details of the maturity model, when we started to develop the DDRRM model, we had to ask four questions. And the first question was, what is the maturing subject? In case we are talking about digital resources and technology. So we have to come with what a, a, a definition of what we mean by digital resources technology. Talk about data, or talk about basically computer algorithm, or talk about computer infrastructure. So we had to really very precisely define what we mean by the maturing subject, in our case, digital resources and technology. And then what is the model is used for? In our case, the domain is disaster risk reduction and management with uh, the broader term, how we manage systemic risk, integrated disaster risk reduction and management, aiming for, you know, uh, Sendai uh, target, framework target, and also for sustainable development goals. Who uses the model? So we're talking about government and institutions, you know, that basically will ultimately use the goal. And then where it will, how it, how it shall be used, how we can actually operate the DR arms. So we develop a set of resources, like, you know, to enable us to do this, you know, you know, different kind of resources that basically will mention like a calculator and so on. We also had taken into account the, what we call it basically 
some consideration and one of them very well known maybe many of you know it is this uh, consideration called basically digital principles or design for digital principles which means that as we are developing the model and we are not developing isolation we are developing with the users so basically like you know in our progress you know we had a bunch of stakeholders that we consulted in the process to develop decide this and also basically like you know understanding the ecosystem understanding basically what we are talking about the digital ecosystem for disaster for using technology and digital transformation you know, designed for scale, so it can be used in multiple scale, national level, province level, local level, and even organizational level. Building for sustainability, so basically the model would basically like, you know, we're looking at how this ecosystem can sustain them itself. Data driven, so we generate from the DDRRM model data that can be used and can be like, you know, and I will show you an example of dashboard that, you know, represent the result of the DDRRM um, assessment and using open standards and so on. So we had to take some also digital principles to enable us to create the model in a way. What all this combined, we generated this DDRRM model. So the model is actually is a hierarchical model, you know, has seven main components that together basically, um, you know, make up this model. So basically each one is equally weighted. The first component is shared data and resources and access. So we look at the shared data and resources and access. The second component has to do with the digital application and services, tools. Third one has to do with the infrastructure. So the three one are really kind of like, you know, IT technology oriented. The other four are more kind of like management and people related. So we are talking about stakeholder using competency, you know, and partnership and you know institutionalization and then governance and policy and then finally which is i think for me usually the final part is always the most important part that is missing a lot from the assessment how this technology really lead to what, what kind of improvement it lead in terms of disaster risk reduction and management what is a tangible use of the technology as i mentioned example before if we have an emergency time are we able to apply this to respond emergency response to a certain time are we able to have early warning enough to evacuate people. So what is the tangible result of the use of the technologies? These are the seven main components. The concept of maturity looks at each of these components in terms of this function of what we call it the maturity function. What are the technology or the data feature or you know that is used data and what is the business process is supposed to support and then whether there is enabling environment for that. Each of these components are you know, evaluated in terms of four scale, you know, uh, you know, like percentage from zero to one or from zero to 100, depends on how you would like to calculate this. And each one has a meaning. So basically, if it goes into the first one is ad hoc, this is the level. This is basically, you, you, you don't have any kind of like, you have technology, but you are not using it in harmony or basically the resources are there, but there is no kind of like clear vision of how to do that. Sometimes you have some sort of recognize the need for this one, but you, there is a sort of some progress, so it is recognized. And then you go all the way to the optimal one. The optimal one is when we come closer to this perfect process. There is no waste of resources. Technology is used perfectly, used as it's intended to. Um, everything is almost in compliance, and we are going this. So it is a maturity model. It's a gradual process that shows basically this. Each context or each country or each organization will basically occupy one, 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 one stage for this. The good news, even with that, that the term optimization is really a floating term because what is optimization use of technology today may change in three, four years. So basically, and therefore, basically, I think the model can be a living document that can allow you to progress over the time and provide the flexibility to improve this, basically, you know, the, the concept of optimization based on what is the state of the art in the technology. Now the model itself is, is delivered into kind of like a hierarchy process. So each component of this has subcomponent and subcomponent has elements and these elements are even divided further into indicators and measures that ultimately allow us to measure the six sigma you know, goal as we mentioned. So to give you an example, a, a tangent of example. So basically this is the component, the first component data access is split into subcomponent we have data framework here and then if we go there we have data availability data management data governance so we have five subcomponent and then if we go actually again in each of these subcomponent is divided into elements and now each of these element has a description of what is the perfect process so for example when we talk about you know fundamental data specification so a perfect fundamental data specification should be 
you know, basically including basically fundamental data sets that, that meet the operational need compliance with this certain standard, ISO 1931 geographic data information, ISO ITS uh, specification, so on. So we have a definition, detailed definition of what is a perfect process of each one. So basically when you do the assessment, you are trying to see how far you are from this perfect process. Do you have all the data? These data are compliant with the standard or not and so on. So basically we have for each of this one, basically a sort of a, the, the maturity to describe what is the perfect process that should be targeted. And then based on how far you are from this perfect process, then you are assigned ad hoc, recognized, defined, or management. This flexibility of having components, subcomponent elements, indicator, and measures give you some sort of flexibility. So you can actually conduct a rabbit assessment. And this is the way that we did with the UNDRR project. When we conducted a rabbit assessment in less than 30 days in 17 different, in 13 different countries, where we can only focus on the subcomponent level. Or if we you would like to do a very, very detailed, thorough assessment, then you can go to the element level. And this is what we did with the UNDP DX for resilience, where we used 80 elements. And each element gives you, basically, when we talk about 80 elements, what we said, we think 80 possible intervention projects can be done in, to improve about this 80 component. And this is basically what the RRM comes in, in, in place, because which one of the 80, if you have to improve about the 80, which is the one more important? So it helps you prioritize your intervention strategy instead of just shooting in the dark. So it gives you flexibility to do course assessment or detailed assessment. It also have what we call it assessment scope. You can actually apply for the entire disaster risk reduction and management, or you can apply for a certain phase. So basically it is designed to allow you to do any, any you know, ideally you should do the entire disaster risk reduction and management, or you can target certain kind of like a small phase, like for example, disaster risk management, disaster uh, planning, disaster mitigation, or you know, response or loss, disaster damage assessment and so on. So the model is designed in terms of it has a hierarchy, so it can give you flexibility between rapid and you know detailed assessment. You can different application scope. You can decide the entire disaster or one phase. It can have basically different assessment scales. It can be done in national, province, local. Most of the example we do do done today are done into kind of like you know national level and organizational level. So it gives you some sort of flexibility. Moving a little bit of some of the how it has been used so far to date. Um, I'll start first by basically how we have used it in this project with the UNDRR. It was a joint project between UNDP and UNDRR and aimed to uh, at assessing the status of national disaster data and database and drive lesson to guide the next generation of uh, disaster data system, national disaster data system or so-called in this inventor. It has been used actually for assessing and national level only at a course level, only the 23 subcomponent for 13 countries like you know Lebanon, Jordan, Sudan, uh, Nepal, Indonesia, uh, Costa Rica, Colombia, Portugal, and Niger and Mauritius and so on. And what we did basically would it allow us a sort of split these different countries based on the assessment result in terms of how they are progressing in terms of digital transformation. We put them into three different clusters, like based on their progress, and looking at basically being able even to align the result from the DRRM with the UN data, uh, data strategy to see how they are progressing in terms of like from UN data strategy perspective or from DRRM perspectives. Ultimately, that led us to kind of like uh, for each one of this cluster, we have three kind of like groups. Some of them are doing better than others. Allow us for each one of them one, write basically like, you know, tell some sort of like, provide some sort of like, you know, understanding for why they are in this particular cluster, give some sort of lesson learned from what they have been doing for basically those people who are progressing better in digital transformation, in this case in building disaster loss and managing the national disaster loss data, informing other countries and capture best practice and ultimately basically provide a sort of like, you know, a wish list for each group, like, you know, or each one, like what is what be the ideal, inter, you know, disaster, national disaster loss data base kind that can be used. So this is just an example that basically the RRM has used and, you know, looking at a very kind of a global assessment of national disaster loss data. The other example is DX for resilience. In this case, like, you know, Rod is going to actually provide a very, very detailed case. I'm just going to give you a big highlight. But what we did basically, you know, detailed uh, assessment in four countries for national level, but at the organization. So overall, we interviewed about 51 different stakeholders in four countries. And for each one, we deleted a very detailed assessment going into 80 elements with, so with, with feedback from each one of the elements. 
and you know coming you know suggesting possible intervention for based on like you know this elements feedback and the assessment generating detailed report each report of this basically goes around like you know over 150 pages and then basically we also what we did we created a dashboard and dashboard that basically that actually can be used by decision maker in different countries, uh, you know, to see the status of the country as a level, like for example, in the Philippines, 2.76, this is the average maturity, which basically put them into the kind of like third stage. You still have like a lot to go in order to reach five. Or you can go to as organization specific maturity status, where you can see basically a specific organization, like, you know, for example, the, um, you know, civil defense, what they are doing in terms of the progress. So basically you can give organization level, um, uh, intervention uh, uh, recommendation or if you are doing a national work and you are allocating budget you can do a national work you can see across organization what are the areas more needed and you can have a national program for improvement so brief results just you know what we have learned from this one it allowed give us lots of rich information i have only four minutes left so let me basically give you this example so for example what we learned in these four countries we have a sort of overall maturity score 2.65 Higher is 3.4, lower is 2.2, which means basically there is a sort of discrepancy between different countries, like, you know, in the way that they are progressing toward the maturity. But none of them is still perfect. All of them has a room to improvement. Even the, the best one, you know, is still still in the 3.4. It has a good, like, it's not in the level four. They can have actually a root room to reach five, in this case, or 100%. We notice also interesting pattern across all the country, and this is coming, that this is the beauty of having all these detailed elements. There is a tendency to focus on the data tool and technology, which is important because we're talking about digital transformation. But who, you know, what is actually overlooked most of the time is capacity building. So basically, okay, having technology without having the people and, you know, and the skills, which is actually number one of the UN data strategy, people and skills that, that operate this technology is meaningless. And then the governments, the policy. So basically, there is so no balance. There is, a, you know, like again, like digital transformation, where there is more weight placed on certain area than other area, which need to be balanced in order to have a sort of balanced progress towards maturity. And then the last one, which was uh, shocking, the whole idea of digital transformation is to support disaster risk reduction and management. But in this seven component, which we call it alignment with DRR operation, how technology really are used to improve the operation, all the all the countries tend to score the least. So basically, it's it's interesting because this whole idea of doing the intervention to support just risk reduction and management. So why we are not seeing tangible improvement in just risk reduction and management as a result of technology intervention? This is a question mark that needs to be addressed. So this is just an example, quick example of the kind of like why DRRM is developed, the rationale of developing this, how it looks like, and sort of uh, basically is giving you a sort of recap of um, of how it has been used. My colleague actually will provide you actually a very detailed study from Philippines. Um, just to, you know, to give you a kind of like an idea, we have basically our website here where we can actually go there. You can download the white papers. And I think basically we ultimately will be providing training very soon to government of official of how to can use this model. So hopefully that is just the beginning of really, you know, scaling up and replicate the use of the RRM across different countries in the world. Happy to answer any question in the question and answer session. And thank you so much for your attention. Over to you, Mayo. Hey, uh, thank you very much, Tarek, for the fantastic presentation and with the detail of the DDRMM. You have elaborated why and how DDRMM was developed and what are the benefits and how it can be used to address the digital readiness and the capacities of DDR, DRR uh, institutions in countries and improve their use of data and technology. Thank you so much. So now our next part of the webinar will be our showcase. Now we will be showcasing a case study on how DDRMM as an instrument being applied in the Philippines. The case study will be presented by Mr. Rodolfo Calzado Jr., the national coordinator of the DXO Regents Project in the Philippines. So Rod, you have the floor. Rod, you are muted. Hi, yeah. Hi, thanks a lot, Mio, and thanks a lot, Tarek, for that presentation. Hi, everyone. So let me just get my presentation. Hold on. All right, I hope everyone can see my screen well. 
So again, I'm Rodolfo Calzado, or Rod, from the Climate Action Program team of UNDP Philippines. And I'm currently handling several projects under our digital transformation portfolio and other special projects. So I'm here to talk about uh, where we started, how we applied the DDRRM model, and where we are right now in terms of implementation. So um, to start things off, when we engaged the government, we presented to them the following as part of our offer for collaboration. So the first is to support them in the implementation of the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Plan for 2020 to 2030. Um, so this entails UNDP to provide them initial support uh, in the implementation of the plan specific to the digitalization of climate change adaptation and disaster reduction space and building upon existing mechanisms, policies, and systems. The second one is to strengthen the foundation of collaboration towards a common direction. So that's for ongoing and future initiatives of UNDP in the same space, among others, and ensuring that it's harmonized and aligned with what the national government would like to do. So um, in terms of the medium to long-term objectives of said collaboration, so there are a couple. So the first is to strengthen mechanisms, policies, and institutional arrangements for promoting interoperability of DRR platforms centered on the preferred platform so of the National Disaster Reduction and Management Council through streamlined processes and informed recommendations for code standardization. The second is to design support to the, to the development of planning generating tools and the National Exposure Database Capture centered on the preferred platform of NDRMC through a human-centric lens. The third is enhanced decision-making support to the NDRMC, particularly for data management and data flow-related matters through a data roster and data flow diagram, among other products and tools. And the fourth is broaden stakeholder engagement and set up for future collaboration. Um, you may notice that a lot of these different objectives are quite specific and some might not use the usual language that uh, UNDP or UN agencies use. And I'll get to that in our next slide. So again, you might be wondering, uh, how did we come up with that offer of collaboration? And where does the DDRRM uh, model fit in? So to tell you the truth, when we engage, first engage the government uh, through a bilateral meeting, they were not too uh, not too keen on, on the collaboration. So the reason for that is that uh, it was first perceived as something that would convolute an already very messy or confusing uh, digital landscape or data ecosystem. As Sir Sani mentioned a while ago, uh, there has to be clarity and uh, a streamlined approach to how we organize things. And during this time, uh, it was very messy, and there were a lot of different competing data platforms. And through our a series of initial bilateral consultations, uh, it became clear to us that everyone was looking for some uh, for for something similar, and that's clarity, clarity of where we are right now and how do we move ahead. So uh, after three uh, bilateral meetings with different government offices, particularly the Office of Civil Defense and the Department of Science and Technology, et cetera, we, we uh, asked for an audience with the council uh, to propose a, a collaboration or an offer of support for the, for the National Disaster Reduction and Management Council. So again, our offering was uh, using the language that they gave to us, and we proposed to help provide some clarity or a better, uh, provide them a better idea of where we are right now, as well as support them in the, in, in the implementation of a strategy, supporting the country's uh, trajectory towards digital maturity. So, um, all right. So uh, moving forward, the first step for us, uh, they like the idea, uh, they, uh, and, uh, with the support of the council, especially the Department of Science and Technology, because they were uh, sort of the champion for this, because they 
we really believed in evidence-based decision making when we first pitched the concept to them. Uh, this led to the the prevention and mitigation pillar signing into resolution a, a cooperation with UNDP on data governance for resilience. So it's a long-term cooperation to help the council, uh, UNDP, uh, establishing UNDP as a core partner in the journey of the count of the country towards uh, resilience in terms of data governance. And through a series of uh, uh, activities together with the council, eventually, after a year, over a year, or almost two years of work with them, eventually the council adopted the final data governance study report, as well as the digital readiness strategy in support of operationalizing the National Disaster Reduction and Management Plan for 2020 to 2030. Okay, so just a few key points. Uh, what was the strategic approach we, we adopted here? So we were very flexible, but we first we were guided uh, to help position UNDP as the government's partner of choice on digital trans transformation in DRR in the resilience building space. The second, we sought to fulfill uh, the in an integrator and convener role, helping bring government, private sector, academia together to overcome political bottlenecks for evidence-based decision-making. So if you remember the DDRMM model that I represented, we, are act we were actually, well, until now, we are actually at the first step, the ad hoc, but at least there's clarity right now where we are. And uh, there's a consensus on how to move forward. The third is to provide UNDP a platform for future projects related to operationalizing the, the, stud, the results of the study as well as the strategy. So later I'll, I'll, also, uh, men, uh, I'll also talk about how it helped our organization make some headway in terms of resource mobilization and, and helping guide and or uh, support some of our more big ticket flagship projects up on top of how it affected government and how they do business right now. Okay, so how do, did we use the DDRRMM model? So there are two components. Uh, uh, this is actually the, work, uh, the workflow of how we use uh, the DDRRM model. So there are two components to that. Uh, the first is the, uh, the DDRMM assessment or scoring sheet, which, which was composed of two modalities of administration. The first is a guided interview. A quantitative, both quantitative and qualitative using the model, as well as a self-administered uh, type of, uh, of assessment. So there were five guided interviews in our case. Those were the most identified to a ranking system, the most critical agencies under the council uh, that worked with data and was relevant to the data governance because uh, the, the data governance space, uh, at least for the DDRMM space here in our country. And the second component is on data mapping and on in the generation uh, in and uh, creating uh, a data flow diagram and inventory of what data currently exists in this space and what are the different data platforms that are being used by the national government, business academe, as well as local government unit. So this would not have been possible without the support of government in this space. Uh, because uh, a lot of the information came from them. So uh, it was very critical that we got their buy-in in the first place for this. So I just wanted to highlight as well in our approach, we also incorporated the mapping and analysis of vulnerable groups. So that was a UNDP commission study. Part of our offer in the detailed offer proposal is that we also wanted to incorporate the LNOB principle of the United Nations Development Program before we eventually came up with the digital readiness strategy. Okay, so in the data collection and the respondents for the first component, the DDRMM assessment, there were 17, 17 participating agencies and organizations, uh, academe, government, business, etc. Uh, it, it was a wide roster of different agencies that, that participated and were actually interested in participation. And all of these 17 participating agencies, I'd like to note, actually sent letters of support uh, to the council uh, uh, that they wanted to get involved and be part of the data governance study. And uh, another part under component two, which is the data mapping, uh, 
is uh, the data inventory tool. So there were 10 participating agencies. This was a bit more difficult for them to, 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 to answer because this was a bit more technical. So we actually uh, handheld <laughs> these agencies when we implemented the data inventory. Okay, and for component two, we also had a separate uh, study. Uh, there were 72 respondents from 40 local government units on a very detailed questionnaire and another 549 local government unit responses from the RRM officers on a more a broader research that we did regarding how uh, how uh, uh, how which platforms they were currently using and how they were using these digital platforms in terms of the DDRM space. Uh, all right. So this is a, uh, just a visualization of the the DDRMM dashboard that we that we showed to that we presented to the council and uh, uh, there were several uh, several uh, uh, initial uh, remarks regarding this but throughout the process because we were able to explain to them uh, how to rank themselves and we even uh, and we even provided them uh, some video. Uh, some video uh, walk uh, talk throughs on how to conduct the assessment for the self assessment version of the study. Uh, they were able to appreciate the findings, and eventually these were adopted fully by the council, despite some of the agencies obviously lacking or lagging behind in terms of digital maturity. Okay, so now uh, something a bit uh, really interesting as well for the council was the when we tried to paint. The data ecosystem for them. So there were several elements to this data ecosystem and several entities that were part of this uh, nationwide uh, data mapping exercise for the Philippines. And it was the finding was quite uh, interesting as well. So basically this, this image, which looks like some sort of microchip, it's actually a representation of how data is currently flowing in at least for the DDRR, uh, DRR uh, space of the country and the different various institutions that are involved in disaster reduction. And as you can see, uh, I won't go into too much detail, but there, there were several problems that are that were uh, ish or rather issues or inefficiencies that were diagnosed. So the first obvious one is it's very messy. Ideally, you would have uh, you would have uh, very clear and harmonized entry points of data and out and uh, this, uh, the flow would be uh, very uh, would be unified, not several different data sources pointing towards several different users. So the issue with that, if there are too many data sources and too many different users from uh, using data sources sporadically, the outcome uh, or the analysis and their recommendations, uh, it's inevitable that it will differ in several ways. And that was one of the causes of decades of decades of different uh, bottlenecks in terms of policy adoption or regression in terms of advances in terms of policy implementation because of these different interpretations and the different sources of data. It was very difficult to find consensus in terms of how to move forward in, in the uh, data governance space for DRR in the country. Uh, based on the results of the DRRMM model, uh, as well as the data mapping and data inventory initiative, uh, uh, there were several gaps uh, and challenges in the DRRCCA data governance in the Philippines. I won't go through all of them in too much detail, but the four core, uh, four core uh, gaps or challenges that were identified was the presence of numerous digital platforms with overlapping functions. So it's not a problem. Uh, it became a problem because the interpretations were different, because the data sources were different. Okay. So the next is data access and sharing is not seamless. That was obvious from the diagram, uh, as well as the DDRMM results. There's limited human and financial resource capacities. And for form formulating DRRCC plans and conducting assessments are painstaking and convoluted. Okay. So this is the digital readiness strategy framework uh, 
the reason why this is organized in this way is because it's aligned with the National Disaster Reduction and Management Plan of the country. So one, one takeaway from this on how we present the, the findings or the results of our study into, into a form that's actionable by government is to align them with already existing national plans or, or recommendations to the already existing national plans. And, they, and thereby, it was easier for them to interpret and adopt these findings that we, we had from the DDRRMM, as well as the data mapping. So again, we adopted as well the vision of the National Disaster Reduction Management Plan, which is safer, adaptive, disaster resilient Filipino communities towards sustainable development. And we came up with a high-level roadmap to bridge the current state of the DRCC ecosystem to the ideal structure. So what is this ideal structure? So, uh, well, first of all, there were, uh, before that, there were two work streams, the National Government Agency work stream, as well as the local government unit work stream. So there, there's work on both sides to be done. So what is the ideal structure that we came upon? So this is not us just prescribing. This was, a, this was uh, vetted thoroughly with the council members. And uh, we wanted to feed them information rather than just prescribing or prefabricating something for them and telling them this is what you should do. Uh, we're, uh, the approach we took was uh, having sort of allowing them to, to come to, uh, to terms or uh, a state of self-realization of what the problem really is to drive towards the concluding uh, desired state that you'd like to achieve. So uh, right now, there's a predominant, uh, there's a predominant uh, 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 tool or uh, uh, technology that the government is using for the DRRCC space, and that's called the GRS PH. It has three components uh, helping local government units in, in making their communities more resilient. So we proposed a fourth new application, which was actually something that was already being done with the GRS page, but, but, but wasn't picked up uh, to, uh, by, the, uh, by the broader bureaucracy. And that's the data warehouse component. So it's fascinating for us that in the initial stages of our proposal, the government was very averse to, to the concept of a data warehouse. By the end of this process, they were the ones who were endorsing the concept or the adoption of the data warehouse in the country. So uh, I, I believe Suin can share with everyone uh, the detailed copy of the reports for this, for those who are more interested in detail. So I'm, I'm going to the last two slides. So the first, so after the whole process, uh, it wasn't even the UNDP moving this forward. It was actually the government already. The initiative basically took a life of its own. So uh, the, here uh, I'm showing that uh, the, the government presented the proudly presented the results of the, gover of the data governance study and the digital readiness strategy in the 2022 Asia Pacific Science and Technology Conference for DRR. So we didn't prompt them to do this. They were the ones who, who wanted to showcase this. They were very proud of the work. And uh, this is our Secretary of National Defense, or Minister. Uh, and he even mentioned the results of our study in the Global Platform for Disaster Reduction as one of the core achievements of the council. So he mentioned that the study was conducted and it helped the country institutionalize the most appropriate interagency governance framework. And it helped them design a high level roadmap for an efficient, robust and, opera and operational DRRCC ecosystem. And if you mention the language that the government is doing here, yeah, it appears that they, it's already positioned as, as something that they're owning. They're very proud of the work that was done. And they took ownership of the work uh, that was done. Uh, and we are very happy with that. Uh, actually, it, on the, in terms of UNDP, it also helps us because it helped us position uh, some of our projects to be able to support the government with full acceptance already. We, it, it didn't appear to be something that we were going to them. Uh, prefabricated for them to just swallow. Uh, and I think that really made uh, a big difference in the ownership and adaptability of the government for the initiative that the initiatives that we 
we presented here. So we're moving forward with the DDRMM uh, for quarter three and quarter four with several partnerships. And the government is actually uh, excited, I would say, to work with us in moving forward the, the next actions that were recommended at, based on the results of the study and the strategy that we co-created. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rod, for walking us through the work it has been it has been done in the Philippines and also show us the practical application of DDRMMM and to how to conduct the digital diagnostic assessment and as data governance study in the country. So the work you presented gives us a very solid picture, concrete picture on the utility of DDRMM. So now we have about 20 minutes for discussion and questions. We first would like to give the floor to colleagues from UNDR, SCAP, and UNDP Sri Lanka country office, which is one of the DXO resilience project countries to share their insight. And then we will open the floor to the rest of the audience for questions. So if you have any questions, please insert them into the Q&A box on your screen. And if you want to direct the question to any specific speakers, please also indicate their names. So our first speaker is uh, Mr. Rakur Sengupta, Program Management Officer at UNDR One Office. Rakur, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mio. Uh, and firstly, my sincere thanks to the colleagues uh, at UNDP to give us this opportunity to share our views uh, and our experiences uh, that we had with the DDRM uh, model. Um, let me highlight to you how, how this has been extremely helpful and has been foundational in the new disaster loss accounting system that you know uh, Sani also highlighted in his intervention. So to start off, Disaster loss accounting, the new disaster loss accounting system that we are developing together, UNDP and UNDRR, is a platform that will help analyze disaster trends and their impacts in a systematic manner. Uh, the system will build on the successes and learnings from Dizenmentar, uh, which, as you know, is, is a system which dates back to more than 25 years and is currently available in over 110 UN member states. Uh, this initiative that we are undertaking is a uh, part of our, you know, the, the intent statement of intent that UNDP and UNDRR has signed in 2020. And as part of this, uh, you know, partnership, uh, we are developing this particular system. Now, why are we developing the system and how will it basically what will it, how will it help the countries there are very two simple uh, ways that this would be helpful one is and one and foremost first and foremost is that it will help in better risk governance which comprises uh, prevention mitigation and preparedness measures uh, so it will support national initiatives it will support the government and other stakeholders in better risk governance and this can be in in both the development sphere and also in the humanitarian sphere. Uh, so that is the first and foremost, uh, uh, you know, uh, advantage that, that this disaster loss accounting system will provide. Secondly, it would help in better monitoring and reporting of the impact of disasters on the lives and livelihoods and infrastructures of countries and communities. As you know, we have countries are providing um, annually data on the Sendai Framework Monitoring, which UNDRR is the custodian agency for in terms of providing the SDG reporting. So we are the, we, we consolidate the data that countries provide, which is for a broader set of targets, the seven targets of the Sendai Framework. And from there, we take those, which are the first five targets relevant uh, for the SDGs. So all indicators related to disaster risk reduction in the SDGs come from this. So this would actually help countries to better provide uh, more, uh, you know, consolidated granular data that would be available 
uh, for this uh, SDG reporting system. And this would um, actually provide also help be helpful in providing disaggregated data, which uh, which is uh, possible when we have more um, event based data, which this disaster loss accounting system is expected to have. So what, how, how was the DRM model helpful in, in, in this process? Uh, we are in, of course, in this process of developing this system and I'll go in, in a bit how, where we are in that process. But how did the, this model help us? So what we did as already um, Tarek has explained, we had a study of 13 uh, countries uh, we did a basic the maturity assessment and I won't go into the details because um, Tarek has already explained to you from a technical point of view what, what that entails. But basic, what was, it, what was it helpful in? So first and foremost, it was helpful in understanding how disaster databases solutions are embedded in the national data ecosystems and the ownerships of these solutions within the government. Secondly, it helped to explore and develop an in-depth understanding of the situational context and reality of the countries concerning disaster databases. This disaster databases. Thirdly, it captured the crucial role of the government agencies in the institutionalization of, an, uh, of disaster related loss data system like this and Ventar. Uh, but of course, as you know, Designer is one of the many uh, disaster loss accounting systems. There are others as well. So that this it helped us understand, you know, how the government plays a crucial role. But as we also know that disaster loss systems, uh, accounting systems are also currently developed by other stakeholders. So it it helped us understand the government's roles and the others. One important uh, point I wanted to reflect, which which um, uh, Tarek also, also mentioned, and that was the disaster loss accounting system that we are developing is totally based on the UN data strategy. As you would know, in 2020, the SG, we have a, a, a UN-wide data, SG's data strategy. Uh, that all um, UN organizations, be it the Secretariat, funds and programs, all agencies are expected to develop a UN data strategy based on that, uh, sorry, their own strategies based on the UN data strategy. So UNDRR is already working on that, just like, you know, uh, Sani mentioned about the digital transformation strategy that you have. We are working on a UNDRR data strategy uh, based on that UN strategy. and we are also modeling the disaster loss accounting system on the pillars of the UN data strategy or the enablers of the UN data strategy. Uh, and so what we did was uh, that even for this, this maturity assessment model, we tried to ensure that we have, uh, we, we, uh, that they, these same enablers were um, accounted for. And these four account, um, um, enablers are, data governance and strategy oversight, technology environments, people and culture, and partnerships. So as you can see, the seven components that Tarek mentioned uh, that form the part of the DRM model fit very well or integrate very well with these pillars. So the assessment also take, took into account that how the interlinkage is established with the UN data strategy. Um, I will uh, just a few points that the disaster locker accounting system would look at the new system uh, just to highlight important ones. One is the hazard classification that UNDRR and the International Science Council has developed. There are 302 hazards on, uh, that have been developed there. Um, it is also being modeled on the disaster um, related statistics that UNDRR, UNDP, UNSCAP, uh, they, we are all working towards a common structure based on actually XCAP's disaster, uh, disaster related statistic framework. Uh, so that would be incorporated. And one other important uh, aspect is the um, catalog, catalog of hazardous uh, events that WMO has established. And that, that would also help uh, in, uh, you know, kind of categorizing the hazards in terms of the multiple effects that they have. I'll, I'll, and this is my last point is about the process where we are on the disaster accounting system. So 
we have conducted a basic needs analysis and approach earlier this year we are just about starting the prototyping phase uh, which will be followed by a system design this we we hope will be undertaken by uh, the end of the third quarter of this year and thereafter uh, the last quarter and the first quarter of 2023 we are hoping to have a basic uh, software developed which is will be available for data beta testing and that we will be piloting in partnership with UNDP in 25 countries uh, which will we will choose in on the basis of like the 13 countries of the on the, the assessment that was conducted but also on other um, criteria that UNDP has and also from our uh, side from UNDP side we have the graph and risks risk, uh, models that we are working on uh, so basically we will choose countries on that basis and that will be undertaken uh, over the uh, over the 2023 till the end of 2023 so uh, i just wanted to give you a snapshot of how what our plans are regarding the disaster loss accounting system and how the uh, disaster i mean the drrm uh, model has helped us in developing that or is help, helping us developing further thank you so much thank you rahul for your sharing so our next speaker will be the miss Madhurima Sharka Swaiskut, Economic Affairs Officer at the Disaster Risk Reduction Team, ICT and DR Division, UNSCAP. Madhu, you have a floor. Uh, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, I apologize. My video, for some reason, does not seem to be working, but uh, uh, nevertheless. Uh, so I just wanted to... Um, Obviously, you know, uh, I think Rahul gave a very nice sort of brief insight into into this DDRM methodology, um, and I sincerely thank uh, colleagues at UNDP for um, you know inviting us to provide some of these insights. Um, <clears throat> looking at the presentations and the methodology, I think that this initiative really fills a gap in understanding. Um, you know, the data ecosystem of the countries, as well as um, understanding how to at least starting and beginning to understand how to monitor some of the uh, uh, s some of the data across countries. So sort of, um, you know, uh, operationalizing the interoperability um, that has been such a big um, a big uh, issue of discussion when we talk about data statistics. Um, I think from uh, and the date and as well as the data ecosystem um, of various countries, uh, I think from SCAP, uh, we will also take a closer look at the framework and really try to understand how we can use this methodology uh, to provide both a more sort of standardized as well as disaggregated data analytics, um, because I think that is very, very important is both the standardization uh, of the methodology across uh, data platforms, as well as how to uh, provide additional disaggregated data analytics that's also um, been validated. So I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a really good framework and a model for us to understand and look at. Um, at SCAB, just, just uh, talking a little bit on how we can uh, further take this forward. Um, at SCAB, we have a digital analytical database um, called the SCAB Asia Pacific Risk and Resilience Portal. Uh, and we use the disaster statistics framework uh, to understand disaster analytics, disaster and climate change analytics for countries in the Asia Pacific region. And I think it would be great to collaborate to really understand how we can use the DDR methodology in, in our upcoming work as well to take uh, uh, to incorporate that into our sort of data data platforms and the data uh, data of like our own data ecosystem, um, so that again we we can standardize um, and have an interoperability across data platforms. So I think this is a very 
interesting initiative. And um, I do have some questions on the sort of modeling for the uh, DDRM, but uh, maybe I can, I can ask those during the Q&A. So I will stop here and, uh, and, and I think we can move forward with like the discussion. It's very interesting and uh, thank you. Thank you, Madhur, for your sharing and insight. So our last speaker is Mr. Manjura Bandara, project coordinator for disaster risk reduction at the UNDP Sri Lanka country office. Manjura, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Manjula. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, represent the uh, country office of Sri Lanka on this uh, webinar. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I would like to uh, give some background of this uh, assessment. Uh, in Sri Lanka, this assessment was uh, conducted for five institutions directly uh, involved in DRR activities. So Disaster Management Center, the National Disaster Relief Service Center, this, uh, Department of Meteorology and, uh, uh, and National Building and Research Organization, and finally, uh, Department of Irrigation. The lead agencies was by uh, Disaster Management uh, Center in Sri Lanka. So we have find some uh, important factors in this uh, assessment uh, process. So it's a very important to orient the uh, head of the uh, institutions and the respective technical or staff, in both uh, DRR and IT department on this uh, assessment process. It's a very uh, essential uh, things we have find in this process. In uh, also the important to uh, clear the scope of this uh, assessment. Uh, as most of the digital, uh, the time the digital systems are narrowed down to the uh, hardware, software, and the ICT equipment. So we have to clear out them to the the, the scope also. The another thing is the uh, the. Uh, accurately identify the policy recommendations in the uh, countries. So it's important to identify the difference between the national ICT and the data sharing policies and institutional data sharing uh, policies, uh, also the guidelines, it's the, another thing. So sometimes institutions uh, tendence to the, tendence to uh, compare uh, scoring against other, other others, rather than the focus on their own maturity levels, which are heavily depend on the uh, mandate of the respective institutions. So another thing we have learned in this process. So the, the other thing is the updating the da dashboard to reflect the performance of individual institutions uh, would be the would be a challenge in future since the uh, commitment from uh, all institutions are needed for the this process. So, however, we have uh, some uh, institutions are ex uh, experienced in this uh, in their interest to implement the recommendations proposed by the our uh, uh, digitalization roadmap using their available resources. That's the uh, things we have found in the Sri Lankan context. The national building research organizations have committed to. Uh, implement their own things uh, the, with the available resource used for these uh, assessment results and maintaining the dashboards and the things. So that things we have uh, we have uh, in, uh, find this in process. So that's uh, from our side. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity. Okay, thank you very much, Manjura. And thank you again for all the speakers for sharing your reflections and thoughts on the uh, benefit of DDRMM. So now we would like to turn to the questions from the audience. So we so far received one question in the Q&A box. This is from Hariyanti Snarta. Uh, she is from uh, UNDP Indonesia country office. So, I would like to ask about the use of DDRMM at the subnational level, the context of disaster risk management and the data ecosystem, and digital transformation adop adoption readiness at the subnational levels are usually different from the national level. Are there best practices in applying DDRMM at the subnational level? 
and what are the considerations to apply this methodology at the subnational level? So I would like to ask Tarek to answer these questions. Tarek, please. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Haryanti, for your uh, question here. I, I think to, to answer your question, I think that DDRRM model with the 80 elements that it provides, it, it gives us flexibility to tailor the assessment based on what you are basically working on. So if you are working with a sub-provisional, you know, uh, you know, level, maybe the goal of the scope of the assessment, like we'll talk about basically like, you know, pre-disaster, disaster, you know, and after the disaster relief, you know, have different kind of like, we have different scope. Maybe you have just sub-scopes or not talking about this comprehensive scope, or maybe we'll talk about specific, you know, area for that. So what we can do basically, I think that the assessment itself will not change. And, but that, you know, the focus of the assessment, the, the, the topics that you are assessing will change. For example, just to give you a concrete example, if we say basically the maturity model say the data set need to be comprehensive, accurate, and precision. It does not say what data sets are. So if we only have one map, that's the only one that this organization is using, for their operation, and it is up to this standard, then basically they score, they are mature in using that one. Another organization may have six or seven different data sets, so you have to assess the status of each data set. So what, what the model is, as the model itself, it can be applied in different levels. And actually the fact that we have 80 elements, which basically it allow us to also to um, kind of like, um, you know, tailor the result for the purpose that we have. For example, uh, we saw in the Philippines, that um, the result were tailored to support basically to align with the national strategy, which has, you know, does, even though we are talking about seven components from the DRRM model, but they grouped it into three components that belongs to the national strategy. The same for the UNDRR, we were able to actually get the result and do the result to match this four component of the UN SG data strategy. In case of Sri Lanka, and we have Mandula talk, actually they took it in different levels. They had basically like each assessment was done on the organizational level and they developed a roadmap for each organization of how the organization, specific organization. So they, they made basically four road, five roadmaps. One roadmap for each organization have to can improve their maturity because organizations in Sri Lanka have different levels of progress. And then they meet one cross cutting issued for the country. So what we have learned so far from what we have seen that you can actually apply the, the, the model in different way at organization level. And you know, so the, the, the criteria or the element against which you're evaluating are the same, but the, maybe the, the nature of evaluation basically will be different because you know, so when you say data quality, it, all data has to be in quality, but what's the meaning of the quality of this you know, organization that sets force um, uh, by the organization, um, um, you know, uh, you know, like th then how many data that need to be the quality of different from one organization to another. So I would say basically it can be applied for any any in the local le levels, but just you know that's, that's just basically it just tailors the result to fit um, the purpose of this organization. So over to you. Please. Thank you, Tarek, for answering clarifying. So I think now we received another question from Kushraf, and this question is to you, Rod. So the, the question is about great to see the government involvement and ownership for the process and outcomes, including the roadmap and implementation strategy. Was there any discussion around the cost required to implement the strategy? So Rod, can you quickly give the answer to this question? I, um, yeah, um, the way we went about it is we aligned the, the digital readiness strategy with the already existing National Disaster Risk Adaptive Management Plan. So basically, we positioned it as a supplementary document to the said plan. And this plan has its own uh, funding mechanism. So basically, we provided detail in terms of the digital transformation aspect of the plan, which the agencies are in the process of developing their year-on-year -year budget. So basically, the funding for the implementation of the strategy was tied to the to the to the national disaster risk reduction and management plan process of the government. So uh, there are some aspects to the strategy that uh, require something that something that goes beyond just fund uh, financial needs. And that's where 
UNDP uh, was able to find as well penetration points to provide support to the government. And uh, basically, the government is moving ahead with the implementation of the strategy. Uh, but UNDP, uh, we have some projects that are now also aligned with the implementation of the strategy. So it improved as well the harmonization of the different actions that we were having with uh, in alignment with what the government is planning uh, in terms of the operationalization of the NDRM. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Rod. So I think uh, now we have come to the end of our question is question and answer session, unless anyone has any burning questions. Okay, so the, I want to thank Sunny, all Sunny the- has her hand raised. Oh, okay, sorry, I didn't see that. Yes, Sunny, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, no, it's, it's really not a question, but uh, uh, I, I, I probably have a response or a proposal to Haryanti's question. It's, it's uh, well elaborated uh, from the perspective of the model. Thanks, Tarek, and applauding Tarek for uh, emphasizing that uh, this can be adapted into the context uh, of an organization or a territorial unit that, that, that the, the model can apply. And this also uh, is related to um, Madhu's uh, question or comment. No? This, the, if, the, the, if the issue is interoperability, you know, how do we apply the model? And the answer is yes, it, it's, it's one of those factors that the Philippine case study has presented. Uh, the data flow, the, the lack of uh, or the inadequacy of uh, data agreement on the data elements and the data uh, architecture that composes the, the, the composite uh, data warehouse. So th those are very important uh, ad adaptation that can happen based on the models. Now, thinking aloud on, on the local government units, uh, I, I think, Haryati, that, that will be an interesting follow-up uh, adaptation. You know? uh, when I when I was uh, re listening to your your inquiry, you know I thought about okay, uh, what are the functions of the local governments that are not uh, that are unique to the local governments in building resilience? And very quickly in my mind, uh, I I concluded that there are differences between the functions of local government units with national government agencies. For example, uh, the importance of uh, land use planning as an important component of, of reducing risk, the enforcement of building codes that uh, helps uh, infrastructure be better mm -hmm. protected from natural hazards. Uh, I, I would say that, that Tarek is correct, you know, that can be adapted. Uh, however, uh, local governments have unique role and, and so you probably don't need 80 indicators. You probably need uh, a set of indicators that are unique to local government units. And the examples I just provided are probably more important to, to local government uh, rather than the national government agency. So I look forward to you know, further co-creation of how we can adapt this to local, for local government. So I think this is a very important point that Haryanti raised. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sunny, for sharing. So I think we received another question from Vini. Uh, thank you for present. Thank you for the presentation. Many countries may have already undertaken similar initiatives, but probably not in a systematic manner. What is the prerequisite for rolling out the DDRRMM in countries? Can the countries run this initiative on their own or reach out to GPN IBC? This, I may ask, is the Tarek Sani. Yes, please. <laughs> hi, hi, Vinny. How are things in Solomons? Okay, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the way Tarek and colleagues have uh, have developed this is that you know, it, it is something that can be replicated. 
Uh, so we will be running a couple of training programs uh, for for this country. Hopefully you can you can uh, you can participate. I also had similar conversation with our colleague from the Pacific Multicultural Office when we were in Bali, Nicola and Amini, uh, and and we're thinking about uh, as you say if there is demand uh, from your country office like in Solomon Island, uh, certainly we would be happy to. Uh, continue co-creating this solution in the context of what you are experiencing in the Solomon Island. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sunny. So I think now we have even exceeded the time allocated for the question and answer. So now I would like to move quickly to discuss the way forward. So now I would like to invite Ms. Soimban, who will be speaking on behalf of Raja Sharma, who unfortunately is not able to join us today. Soim is an urban risk resilience consultant at the UNDP Bank of Regional Hub. Soim, please go ahead. Uh, so thank you very much, colleagues, for joining the webinar. Uh, I would like to share with you the DDRRMM next steps. Uh, building upon our successful DDRMM assessments, this year uh, UNDP will develop a training course on the DDRMM assessments methodology, which we will conduct in Nepal and the Philippines. Uh, the training course aims to help government officials to conduct assessments and institutionalize the methodology. During the training course, we will help government officials Firstly, to understand the DDRMM methodology and how it supports digital transformation for disaster risk reduction and management. Secondly, to learn how to conduct DDRMM assessments, interpret the results and communicate them to decision makers. Thirdly, to learn how to utilize the outcomes of the DDRMM assessments in delivering recommendations for digital transformation interventions in support of disaster risk reduction. And lastly, to learn how to use the DDRRMM assessments for evaluating the impacts of the interventions that are designed to accelerate digital transformation for disaster risk reduction. The training course will be contextualized for each country context. The trainings will be conducted tentatively in August this year with each course taking three to four days and will include face-to-face -face instruction and hands-on exercises. The target audience of the trainings is decision makers, senior managers, and technical personnel at governmental institutions working on disaster risk reduction. We will request government officials to nominate around 25 to 30 people who will benefit from participating in the training. Uh, colleagues from UNDP country offices in the Asia Pacific region, as well as other regions, other UN agencies, or government officials who are interested in conducting DDRMM assessments, please free, uh, feel free to reach out to Rajesh and myself. Uh, UNDP, in close collaboration with UNDRR, ESCAP, UN Women, and UNACR, stand ready to support the implementation and institutionalization of the DDRMM methodology, which we believe is a useful tool to meet government's needs. Thank you. Thank you, Suim, for outlining the DDRMM next steps. So now I would like to hand it over to Mr. Rahul Sengupta to close the webinar. Rahul Sengupta is the Program Management Officer at the UNDR Bonn Office. Rahul, over to you. Thank you so much, Mio. I think uh, a lot has been said and there's not much to add. I mean, it's, it's, it was wonderful to uh, you know, be with friends and colleagues again, you know, uh, Sani, Tarek, Suin, um, uh, Madhu, we, we, we've always been working together and this uh, particular initiative i just wanted to say you know you've heard a lot if if there's some big main takeaways that you can take from this you know 90 minute session that we had is that just remember the drm model how useful it has been you heard uh, you know sani talk about how it has been implemented in across uh, across the region and beyond uh, you've heard how you know undr and undp 
together brought it uh, you know to to different regions of the world and specifically to 13 countries uh, <clears throat> you had heard about the technical uh, you know issues or aspects of of the model but i'm sure you may not remember everything but the tarik is always there for an email away at any point of time you can send him a mail and you'll get the details um, so don't worry if you haven't remembered every every component <laughs> of of the uh, of the um, model but but uh, i mean jokes apart tarik is is is, is very helpful and will be able to provide you all the details on that but what was i think uh, great for us to all learn is how it has been implemented in countries you heard uh, from the philippines you heard from sri lanka and that's where the test of the pudding is really if it is helpful for the country that that's that's what makes all the difference uh, as madhu mentioned you know there are a lot of um, you know synergies in, across agencies that we can work together on on this area um, so and and i think eventually i would say the two um, important points that Soen highlighted uh, is uh, are the trainings in August. So keep please keep, you know watch that space. Those of you who are interested, please register for that. And one important one that uh, Sani mentioned about the white paper on the DRM model. I think we should all keep in mind and have, have a you know good look at it. Go go through it and you know provide our uh, inputs as we can to to the UNDP colleagues. Um, I hope I, yeah, there you go. We have again, so I shared the, the paper here on the chat box. So please feel free to have a look. Uh, and, and from UNDP's side, I, I, I would like to, again, you know, thank, uh, the UNDP colleagues, uh, for, you know, in, inviting us and giving us this opportunity to share our uh, views and also our experiences on, uh, on this DRM model. So I wish, uh, the, um, uh, UNDP colleagues on this particular project, all success. Uh, we are there for, for you know to work together. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you, Rafur. So uh, we also would like to thank you again to colleagues from UNDR, SCAP, UN Women, and UNHCR for confirming that you will continue to work closely with us on the DDRMM training and uh, that uh, application. Thanks everyone for joining us today for the webinar. And please feel free to contact Suin and Rajesh if you have any particular questions or require any particular information from our side. Thank you again and goodbye. Have a good day.